Welcome to the July 19th, 2017 meeting of the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. We all join me for a Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. It's nice to see everyone. Now, before we call roll, we're dressed as uh, summer attire, preferably Hawaiian shirts. That's, so that's why I'm dressed like this. <laughs> Ms. Domingo, would, would you please call roll? Commissioner Engler? Here. Commissioner Lemo? Here. Vice Chair Simpson? Here. Chair Reeder? Here. And Commissioner Gregory is absent. Thank you. Ms. Zambrano, um, would you describe how public comments are addressed? This is a time and place for public comments. A speaker card is available for those wishing to address the Traffic Commission regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction. Speakers for specific agenda items will be called and heard during that particular agenda item. All remarks should be addressed to the Traffic Commission as a whole, and all documents for the Commission and the official record should be presented to the Recording Secretary prior to speaking. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be acted upon by the Traffic Commission unless listed on the agenda, but may be referred to the City Engineer for administrative follow-up. Currently, we have one speaker card for public comments, and pursuant to Traffic Commission standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. The yellow card will be displayed when you have one minute remaining, and as comments can only be recorded while speaking into the microphone, please refrain from addressing the commissioners unless you're at the podium. If you're unable to come to the podium or should you need to step away while speaking, a wireless microphone is available for your convenience. Also, please silence all cell phones during the meeting. And I just basically want to open up a discussion about Lynn Road and the noise. Um, my husband and I have lived there for 20 years. We moved into the house realizing it was busy. Um, I called a couple of weeks, actually probably a month ago, spoke with Sergeant Patterson, and he suggested that I time when the, the loud cars go by because they don't have enough people to adequately patrol the area and that's kind of amazing to me considering how busy that area is. Um, it has only gotten worse um, in the 20 years that I've lived there. I cannot sit in my backyard and have a conversation uninterrupted. Un I can't leave my doors and my windows open on my house and listen to my TV in a normal area in the ways. Um, I found uh, some information called the noise element that supposedly we're supposed to have a um, st noise study done every 10 years in the, the city of Thousand Oaks. And it, as far as I know, the last one was done was 1998. So we're way past due. And I would love to see um, some, some studies done. Um, I did speak with um, Kathy Lowry, I believe her name is, and she suggested that I build a sound wall. Um, that's, if you look at the property, we're the southwest corner of Lynn and Jans. We are kind of point zero for noise there. Um, a lot of acceleration, um, a lot of illegal um, exhaust, I believe, is coming up and down that road. Um, never see anybody in the, um, the areas that are marked off for um, motorcycles. We're supposed to have motorcycle cops there. Um, I go down that road all the time. Nobody drives 45. If you drive 45, they're not happy with you. So I, I would like to see something done about Lynn Road. Um, we have a lot of kids, and when those vehicles go by, 
they're, we're lucky if we can get them to wear helmets. They're sure not wearing earplugs. And it is damaging. So I know it's over 70 decibels. I've tested it. So please do something. Thank you for coming here and expressing yourself. Appreciate that. Um, does staff have any comments? Um, we will uh, have uh, Jim Ashika will give her his business card and we will follow up with her offline. Thank you. We have a second public speaker. That is T.C. Simmons, please. Thank you. Please, uh, for the record, J.C. Simmons. J.C. Simmons. Sorry, and I was here to speak about the Rancho Road. Yes. Uh, please state your city of residence. Newberry Park. For the record, appreciate it. Thank you. Past 35 years. And I was here to speak about the Rancho Road uh, improvement. Oh, I'm sorry. The card was listed under public comment, so I'll make that correction. Our next public speaker is a former traffic commission member. Nice to see you, Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, very uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Andrew Fletcher, uh, Westlake Village, uh, California. Uh, here tonight just to address um, one main issue um, is that I've just been asked, I live in the Hidden Canyon uh, condominiums right next to uh, Westlake High School. And I've just been approached by a number of residents who wanted me to come and address it, but I thought it would be obviously best to bring it to the Traffic Commission. At night, uh, I've noticed a number of um, speeding vehicles, I would say, between the hours of roughly 7 p.m. to late into the night, 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. There's a nice little clear stretch of road about a quarter mile that goes right next to West uh, Westlake High School. And I can't tell if they're necessarily drag racing or racing but they're certainly traveling at speeds which are high 70s 80s very very recklessly um, I've seen it very rarely but you can certainly hear it and a number of neighbors knowing that I'm on you know the Planning Commission have approached me about it but I wanted to certainly address it to the proper body and uh, you know Sergeant Patterson so that's really my largest my concern here tonight thank you thank you for coming appreciate it Ms. Zambrano, I believe that concludes our public speakers. That's correct. But does staff ha have any comment on our last speaker? Um, we will uh, uh, work with the uh, Thousand Oaks Police Department, and uh, I believe they've probably made note of those comments, and we'll follow up. Thank you. Our next item is summary notes. Commissioners, any comments? None. Thank you. Next, we begin our engineer reports. The first that the staff will address us is the uh, Rancho Road pedestrian and bicycle improvements. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us to present the Rancho Road sidewalk and bike lane improvements. Uh, my name is Mike Tahidian, senior engineer. I'm assistant by uh, Jorge Munez, assistant engineer sitting in the audience. The city plans to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety on Rancho Road between Thousand Oaks Transportation Center and Thousand Oaks Boulevard. Our Main goals, as I stated, improving pedestrian safety and connectivity, and improving bicycle facility safety and connectivity. Other goals that we're pursuing are reduce weaving and merging conflicts uh, that exist on Rancho Road, maintain city's minimum level of service of C at intersections, uh, meet Caltrans design standards since we are working there right away and install improvements that they're consistent with Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan. Here's the overall map of the existing conditions. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, some features. Uh, salt bond ramps are, uh, we have an existing all-way uh, 
s stop sign, which is expected to operate at the uh, level of service of F, considering future traffic volume generated as part of Thousand Oaks specific plan when it's fully developed. At, at, at North Mound Ramps, uh, we have a number of challenges. Uh, we have a, a, a right turn on North Mound off ramp, a, a free right turn um, that creates a, a challenge with weaving and merging of um, through traffic. We also have a, a double right turn onto North Mount on ramp, which does challenge to the bicyclists trying to cross that intersection. And we're also missing the sidewalk on the west side, uh, leading to Thousand Oaks Transportation Center. So we'd, we we like to make improvements on on, on all those aspects. So first, South Pond Ramps intersection, we don't have any plans to reconfigure the lanes at this intersection, but as I stated earlier, we expect the uh, operation of this intersection to be uh, poor uh, when Thousand Oaks Boulevard is fully developed. And in fact, uh, Thousand Oaks specific plan did identify this intersection as, uh, as part of their traffic mitigation that a, a traffic signal needs to be installed here based on future volume. Um, the other improvements that we're considering uh, are um, putting a, a protected bike lane at this intersection with raised medians on either side of it. They'll be operating with the same control as we're providing to pedestrian to cross that intersection. Um, class, <coughs> excuse me, class two bike lanes uh, throughout. As a standard procedure, we consider all the alternatives to uh, traffic signal and our consultant considered uh, a single lane roundabout that will have its, its challenges with the natural constraint. We have the hillside to the east and ramps to the west side. And as a, as a comparison between alternatives, they, they both traffic signal alternative and roundabout alternative provides additional and improved safety to pedestrians. It will improve uh, bicycle safety uh, both alternatives again check that but the initial capital cost of roundabout is approximately four times more than traffic signal so for that reason staff recommendation is um, traffic signal to be consistent with um, Thousand Oaks Boulevard specific plan as well so the proposed improvements at North Bond ramps we, in order to improve uh, bicycle safety uh, within that stretch of Rancho Road, we considered three alternatives. Alternative one, um, we are proposing some minor um, lane configuration changes. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> they're not minor. We are proposing to remove the free right turn on northbound off ramp and the inside lane on on the same ramp we're going to reconfigure it from a left through to a left through and a right and the in the southbound approach we we propose to eliminate the the right one of the right turn onto the on ramp it 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 results, mathematically, it does result to level of service of C with all these, in, you know, changes. But going back to this, this previous slide, we feel the, it will negatively impact the intersection of Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Rancho Road. We have two double left turn on westbound Rancho Road onto southbound 
I'm sorry, westbound Tarzan Oaks Boulevard onto southbound Rancho, uh, they will compete, uh, the two lanes compete with even bicyclists trying to merge into one lane and um, trying to get on the freeway and we feel that it will create backup and delays at the intersection of Teo Boulevard and, and Rancho. Alternative two that was considered, it's kind of a status quo. We're not proposing major changes except providing class two bike lane on most of Rancho Road and Sherrill's in the southbound direction. The proposal is to maintain the, the remaining lane configuration here and it will result in a uh, level of service of C. Finally, alternative three, we, we propose to provide class two bike lanes on, on, the, on the corridor and there'll be elimination of the free right turn on northbound off-ramp and the inside lane of the northbound off-ramp will be restriped to a left through and a right and we're going to maintain the double right turns onto northbound um, on-ramp. It is expected to operate at the level of service of C. In addition, to improve uh, bicyclist safety crossing the, the, the double right turn onto Northbound one, on, uh, 101, we're providing a protective uh, or protected bike lane with raised medians at, on, the same, on both sides with again same control as pedestrian to cross that um, double right movement. So here's a quick comparison of, of the criteria that we use to compare these alternatives. We're providing sidewalk for all alternatives, uh, bicycle safety because of uh, um, items that I went over, we don't feel alternative one and two provide the necessary bicycle safety improvements, but alternative three does. Uh, again, weaving and merging issues, um, alternative two was just basically the status quo and number uh, alternative one was negatively actually impacting Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Rancho intersection. Uh, level of service, they, they basically check uh, minimum city standards, again with the exception of Alternative 1, that will uh, have other ramification. Again, since we're in Caltrans Rider, we need to meet their standards. We do have minor or what they call advisory design exception that we have to pursue uh, for a median width and a non-standard feature in the median. So based on this comparison, again, we, we recommend alternative three. We did have a meeting with a uh, bicycle advisory team on May 3rd, uh, 2017, and uh, they provided the inputs to us and we incorporated most of them and uh, here is the list of uh, items that we incorporated into, into the project already. So to, to summarize, these, these are our recommendations. At southbound ramps, we're recommending the traffic signal and northbound ramps, we're um, recommending alternative three with the protected bike lane. As far as the schedule is concerned, uh, we're wrapping up the preliminary design and in fall 2017, we expect to start final design and in a year later, we should be in construction. The preliminary engineer estimate is 1.2 million. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Navidian. It's a big project. Appreciate your yeah, challenging project. description. Yeah, I'm sure it's just the start of, of a long process here. Um, do I have any comments from my fellow commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Lemo? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions and, and then a comment. Um, first of all, I 
99 times out of 100 staff's recommendation usually works pretty pretty good no matter what we try and uh, and dream up. But I, w- I would like to first find out what the cost comparison is uh, between a traffic circle. And I know you might not have as, as strong of an engineer's estimate, but a ballpark. And then what other, I mean, I saw the negatives up there that you, you found for a traffic circle. But I, I'm wondering if at any point in time, maybe not this intersection, but soon, when we see the value in slowing down the traffic on the boulevard, which we are trying to do, and um, we need to find some place that we can actually beta test um, a traffic circle because it slows down traffic, it does determine right of way, it's more pedestrian friendly than, um, well I shouldn't say that, it's, it's more volume friendly than a traffic light. Um, I would never get complaints about anything the city does other than the fact that you have 10 and 15 minute traffic lights because a lot of my older friends, they think that's how long they're waiting. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and one of them's watching tonight. So anyway, if, if you could uh, just a- answer some of those and then I'd have a comment when you're done. Okay, I may have to defer most of those questions to Cliff, but um, Cliff Friendly, uh, but the initial cost you saw it, it was roughly four times more in case of roundabout, and uh, w- currently we simply don't have any budget for that kind of improvements. Uh, so maybe I'll take a swing at the other ones. Um, we actually, uh, pretty much every intersection we look at anymore, we are considering uh, roundabouts. Um, uh, we're, we'd like to see if we could make one work somewhere too. But what, what we're finding is um, if you were starting with a, a, an unimproved site, the cost uh, where you were just doing the rough grading and you were starting over, the, the cost is probably much closer to being the same. The challenge we have is uh, an intersection with a roundabout takes more room than a traditional intersection. So every time we look at that, we're looking at right away. We're looking at regrading. Uh, in this particular location, um, that roundabout requires retaining walls up to 10 or plus feet to cut back into that bank. If you think about that corner, it's actually fairly steep in all directions. So um, uh, interestingly enough, and I'm just speaking at this point, we, we looked at a, uh, a roundabout at Lawrence and Teller. Because we were thinking, now well, there's that. That's a terribly misaligned intersection. Um, the estimate came in about four times the price of a traffic signal. Again, most of those again is about uh, relocating infrastructure, uh, drainage. If if you think about everything that's associated with an, inter- an existing intersection, it's relocating all the storm drains. It's moving all the sidewalks. It's acquiring right of way. It's encroaching on all four corners. So. That's our biggest challenge at the moment is is we we keep trying to put them in locations that are already built out and this this number of three to four times kind of keeps coming up but we'll keep looking. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. I just had what kept it sort of top of mind. I just received what we thought was a proposal, but I guess it's it's a, it's a work schedule for the county of Santa Barbara putting a roundabout at an exit to a freeway. And that seemed to me you know, existing exits, so they're going to have all the costs. Um, but what I, I thought was, well, if, if there are people out there, because everything seems to be built up, experimenting with what I would consider a more dangerous situation there. Um, so maybe you know we can we can look at it, continue to look at it in the future. But you're right, the cost here is probably more than four times more when you put in retaining wall and everything. But thank you very much. I think you guys did a great job. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments, Commissioner? I thought I heard that we you were in your planning that you were treating the northbound the northbound ramp on, on ramp differently than the um, than the off ramp from the, for um, northbound. If you're as people are exiting the 101 southbound, am I correct or am I getting it wrong? It sounded like you were doing a, like a, a you were. So alternative three, which was our recommended alternative, does remove the free right turn 
on northbound off ramp, mm -hmm. but it doesn't propose any other significant change except also restriping the inside lane of that off ramp from a left through to a left through and a right. And this is again for the improving operation of the intersection. We had to do that restriping, but there is no change at the northbound on ramps. The, we maintain the double right turn. Mm -hmm. So the major change in our recommended um, alternative is at the north uh, northbound off ramp. Because I thought I heard you say you were treating the the south. Um, Northbound exit. I thought I may, I may have misunderstood you mm -hmm. as like a, a roundabout where you, or I don't know what kind mm -hmm. of control you have. Well, that. Uh, yeah, uh, good question. We do have existing signal that will need to be modified again to make sure it you know the, the phasing it needs to have adequate phasing and splitting phasing. So that work will be part of this that I didn't previously covered. Yeah, there is no proposed roundabout at northbound ramps. We have an existing traffic light. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? I can just chime in that I was able to attend a portion of the May 3rd meeting and had the pleasure of getting to hear from some of the bicycle experts on the international front from uh, the Netherlands. And so I think it's super exciting that the city is prioritizing bicycle safety with this project. So I like to see option three as the front runner. Right. I have a question, if I may. On the off-ramp for the northbound traffic on 101, um, I see that the level of service decreases from level A to level C. Could you describe what that means? Well, we obviously a free ride movement will will be superior to any other lane configuration when they have to stop at the traffic light. So that's the, that's the degradation of level of service that we anticipate. Again, as part of uh, mitigating that, that's why we're restriping the inside lane and providing a, a additional right turn because the queuing on the off-ramp without any changes to the inside lane was too too long. So to mitigate for that and reduce it to a reasonable, acceptable level of service, in this case C, we had to provide, essentially we're going to be providing two double rides from northbound off-ramp. Understood. Yeah, you really don't have a ch uh, any choice there to do that. Um, I'm always looking when, we, when we're listening to our staff that we try to um, design intersections that utilize the re least restrictive uh, form of traffic control and produces the most safe and efficient uh, vehicle and pe pedestrian operation. Um, I couldn't uh, agree more with Mr. Lemo. He took the words out of my mouth in a way in that uh, I feel roundabouts solve all the problems as far as uh, conflicts because uh, the signals um, establish uh, by stopping traffic right away, whereas roundabouts uh, control traffic by establishing yields. And therefore, you don't have these T-bone collisions. You have, may have collisions, but they're side swipes and uh, as far as property damage and, and uh, threat to, to life, uh, it's a lot less. But I understand that it costs significantly more, at least at this particular intersection. So my question then, does staff believe that a roundabout is superior to a signalized intersection? Um, that's a little bit of a loaded question. They're, <laughs> they're, they're perfect in the desert where you have lots of room. Um, again, the, the challenge is uh, when we look at what perfect is, um, cost is always a consideration. Value is always a consideration. Um, so we, you know, we, we understand all of the, the benefits of a roundabout. I think most of us have all driven through them and, and intuitively you know that you're going to have low speed collisions, not high speed collisions, which ultimately will be safer. You're always concerned, you know, the pedestrian at those intersections aren't protected at a roundabout. So you're hoping that 
people are driving slowly, which they should be, but that they're not distracted by other cars entering the intersection such that they miss a uh, that they might miss a pedestrian that's in the crosswalk. But again, there's not a lot of data available yet in some of these areas. These are all kind of in, intuitive ideas and and so so in this case, um, I'll tell you if Caltrans was willing to give us another two and a half million dollars, um, we you know would would probably push this forward. But in this case, um, right now we're expecting we've got about eight hundred thousand in grant funding for this project. Um, and I don't, I don't suspect there's another two million out there that they're willing to give us. So, um, just to comment on what you said too, I, I, I did a little research in February of this year. The Federal Highway Administration's office uh, identified roundabouts as proven safety countermeasures to traffic lights um, because of their ability to su substantially reduce the types of crashes that result in injury or loss of life. So. Um, they went on to say that uh, roundabouts are designed to improve safety for all users, uh, including pedestrians and bicycles. So I would sure hope that uh, the city of Thousand Oaks at some point in time, as Mr. Lem or Mr. Lemo mentioned, that we could dip into this concept and uh, evaluate for ourselves how it serves the citizens of this city. Um, one other consideration, too, is, is aesthetics. Now. The, the southbound 101 coming into our city to go to the new Thousand Oaks business area that we hope to develop, um, that's going to be their, fir their first impression of our city. So we're going to put up more traffic light poles, more signs, more green lanes and striping, and this. that's going to be their first impression of our city as opposed to a roundabout. There are no signals. There are no poles, no signs. We have a center median that has landscaping. Welcome to the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, I, I just wish we could afford to do something like that. Um, and I, I want to speak uh, among our commissioners for a moment later as soon as Mr. Lemo uh, has his comments. So thank you. Um, yeah, I just I wanted to mention something because uh, I probably saw 70 to 100 traffic circles in the past month and a half due to some travel. There is a huge difference between successful traffic circles in the United States and successful traffic circles in Europe. It seems like you can put together a traffic circle in Europe from the materials you have in your garage. There is nothing aesthetically pleasing about one, and I, and I saw dozens of them. The one thing I did notice, except for right in the adjacent to the heart of the city, it was absolutely safer for pedestrians, but the ones that were out in the um, uh, areas like Newbury Park, where we have um, uh, some commercial that is uh, office and such, there was no consideration given to safety for the pedestrian at all. I, I mean, they looked... A little like you know Frogger in the cartoon trying to get across the street so we have a, a whole bunch of things that we have to look at or I would hope we look at beforehand and that is the cost here is tougher the um, protection against uh, individuals who make a living out of suing our city is a lot different in the state of California than almost anywhere else in the world and those things drive up costs um, the last but not least, the only way that you could really cover those costs is if you can come up with developer fees. And I think this town is pretty much tapped out on that. So cost is is what gets to be the discussion issue, but there's so many things that raise the cost of it here. You and I wanted to have, you know, a, a, a welcome to Thousand Oaks in the inside. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars for a variety of reasons. And we haven't even touched upon relocating utilities, which I never gave any thought to. Again, in Europe, not the case. Uh, some of the towns I went to, the people didn't even have utilities. <laughs> so, you know, those are that's what makes our discussion a broader non-traffic discussion uh, because we also want everybody to stay in budget. So it's, 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 a, it's a real tug of war. Thank you, Mr. Lemel. Um I would just like to ask my fellow commissioners, um, 
how do you think we should approach uh, the financial aspect of this? Uh, obviously, the city doesn't have any money for this particular thing, but should we still uh, make some recommendations to the city council and let them decide whether we have the money for it or not? Any comments on that? Well, based on this information, I totally am comfortable uh, with the recommendations to avoid the traffic circle at this particular lo location due to the cost-benefit ratio. So in this specific situation, um, you know, I don't think that this project would warrant going on ahead with a recommendation. But perhaps in other projects where it is more about the aesthetics and making that wow factor of presenting the city of Thousand Oaks, that might be something a little bit different. Thank you. Well, as a comment to that, uh, Kimley and Horn were the engineers, and uh, their um, actual conclusion was that the roundabout alternative has the higher safety performance benefit cost. So it, we're actually producing a, safety, a safer intersection, but at a higher cost. And then how do you put value to the damage to automobiles, injuries to pedestrians in line with what you're spending to create that intersection. So I see what you're saying, but there's a good argument on the other side too. And uh, I, I think we're gonna have to noodle this type of concept for a while to see wh what is the best. Uh, Mr. Finley, please. Yes, just, a, just kind of a, a comment. Um, this presentation is for information and to receive your comments um, and um, a similar presentation will go to the City Council and uh, we will tell the City Council um, y your comments and concerns and preferences and and talk about all these issues um, so they even though you know we're not asking for you to recommend approval of anything tonight um, just the discussion Understood. and the comments will are valuable and will be carried forward to the con council. All right, thank you. Appreciate the clarification. I'm comfortable with that. Any other comments? I, I do. Yes, Mr. Lemel. So to further belabor the point, um, <laughs> I apologize for that, but I think there's uh, that uh, um, there's some there's a consideration that you, that you brought up, and that was. One place that I, first of all, I think the, the Horn study is great, but it is a general study. It is not a specific intersection study. Um, and uh, so I think we have to keep that in mind. But the other thing here is when you get into a specific intersection, the net result here is more of the boxes are checked off in the infer affirmative with alternative three. So even if we were a city that was enjoying experimentation with traffic circles everywhere when looking and, and I know we're not asked to make a recommendation tonight but when looking at the staff report across the board in this situation where it's, where it's going to differ from your consultants um, it's number three is just a an overall safer it an, uh, alternative and you know one of the things I kind of look at in, particularly in this uh, litigious society is what can the city defend if they're brought into a situation uh, because they usually are carried in anyway? Um, and, and so I think, you know, discussion around and understanding staff report for number three in this situation, I think generally we want to look at more traffic circles, no doubt about it. In this situation, I'd like the message to go to council that um, when looking at the big picture, um, here's what the commissioner said in regards to alternatives uh and i think you know safety is is one of the things i think you're absolutely right traffic signals are cumbersome they're never they're never beautiful i mean they've tried in miami and they look worse when they try and make them look better but um but from a safety standpoint that's what i think is the overriding point here that that helps your recommendation seem stronger at number three Oh, thank you, Mr. Lemo. I agree. Um, number three is is uh, the only solution that I see for the uh, northbound off ramp, but uh, you didn't address the southbound off ramp uh, in your last comment. I I did not. <laughs> and the thing that scares me the most, sir, there you do have a hillside situation, and it's just 
if we were in a world where it was legitimate for at least the city to print money, uh, then I think it's a fair consideration. But there, there is not, I don't believe there is a cost benefit ratio that works in that intersection. I think that it's aesthetically better than what we have now. I think we must, we're, we're going to settle with a signal. There's no way around that, I think. All right. Well, thank you. It's always nice to open up the conversation. Any other comments? All right. We have one public speaker concerning this matter. J.C. Simmons, please. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Uh, please state your city of residence. Sorry, Mr. Reader. Um, J.C. Simmons, Newbury Park, California. Been resident here 35 years or so. Um, avid cyclist. I've been here many times to speak to you about various improvements to the bicycle infrastructure. That we, and we've made giant steps forward. We still have a long ways to go, but we're, we're getting there. Uh, about the Rancho Road uh, considerations, uh, I was at the May 5th meeting when we talked in detail about uh, the green lanes and where to place them and are very pleased with the recommendations coming from, uh, from staff. However, today we were confronted with the fact that uh, a, a roundabout was also a possibility there. That was not brought to the May 8th meeting that I remember. Um, and I would like to, uh, I don't understand where the one, one million seven hundred thousand dollar difference comes between the the signage, uh, the, the signals, and the roundabout. Uh, something about a ten foot retaining wall. Uh, can that be graded? Something about right of way. Well, the right of way belongs to Caltrans pr primarily, or the city. Uh, do we have to pay Caltrans for right of way that already belongs to them to improve their intersection? Uh, I don't know. I would just question the, uh, the the differences in the monies there, and I would recommend strongly that the traffic circle be reconsidered on the southbound off ramp and the or on the northbound the southbound uh, off ramp and the northbound. I like the configuration that they came up with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Appreciate you. Oh, and, and that was the opinion for, on the, the roundabout came from the Bicycle Advisory Committee uh, team uh, that, that adjourned at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for telling us what uh, the Bicycle Advisory team uh, recommended at their meeting today. Appreciate it. Quick comment. An extremely quick comment. Having lived here 30 years, I think there are many other things that you could get away with in this town besides trying to do the necessary grade there to eliminate a retaining wall because you would be certainly cutting in more than uh, the allowable limits. It just it just couldn't work that way. So that's that's why the grading is not a legitimate consideration at this place. Thank you. Do any of my fellow commissioners have a question for Mr. Simmons? None. All right. Mr. Zambrano, for the record, have we Chair, Chair Reader, I have a follow-up. Oh, I'd sorry. like to make a very brief comment. Um, I, I did want to remind the commission, so this is a, a preliminary design. Um, Caltrans um, has yet to weigh in on really any of these alternatives. They're the one that actually require the roundabout evaluation uh, as part of their work. So. They will look at that. They will look at the analysis. They'll look at the cost. Um, again, it's a preliminary cost estimate. Um, so really, all of these things are still on the, the, the roundabout is still on the table, if you will. Um, uh, again, for us, it's, it's, it's not about whether it's a good idea or bad idea. It's simply about the financial implications. Uh, if Caltrans decided, decides they think that's what that's the best option because of safety or because of the reasons uh, they are the funder of this project so they uh, if they if they allow us or give us the ability to get additional funding and they're supportive of the roundabout uh, we will likely be bringing that back to tell you about that thank you well we'll see we'll see what happens thank you uh, for the record were there any written statements uh, regarding this matter Mrs. Amaro yes we received one written statement card and was that in agreement with anything 
That was in favor of a roundabout at the south intersection. Okay. Thank you. And finally, staff, uh, can you uh, respond to uh, Mr. Simmons' comments? Um, I think I did. Uh, did I miss anything, Mr. Simmons? I, I don't believe I missed anything. Uh, we're we uh, again the cost estimates preliminary. It came from the consultant. We haven't uh, we haven't gone into great detail to find out what that included. Um, they are professionals, so we assume it's it's somewhat accurate. Um, but again, Caltrans is going to weigh on in on this as well. Uh, so we're still we're still really in the early stages of this project development. So all the comments will be taken in. Uh, he's absolutely right. We hadn't evaluated the roundabout as an alternative uh, at that May meeting um, that came out from the consultant. So we'll we'll see what the future holds, I guess, and report back to the commission. Very good. Thank you. Our next uh, item on the agenda is to continue the engineering reports. This is item 6C, the Thousand Oaks Boulevard parking space markings, Moore Park Road to Hoden Camp. Did I skip one? Oh, shoot. Okay, here we go. We'll get to that in a moment. 6B, Avenida de las Arboles, uh, Big Sky Traffic Control Improvements. Uh, Mr. Mashiko will have an informational item for us as to uh, what the current situation is there after our improvements. Okay, yes, um, thank you, Chair Reader. Um, this item is to consider traffic control improvements at the intersection of Avenue de los Arbolis at Big Sky Drive, and we're nearing completion of engineering drawings featuring um, street improvements to provide better protection at the intersection. And this evening will be open for public and traffic commission input on the design. So here's a vicinity map that shows uh, the location of Arbalus and Big Sky at the west end of Arbalus. Uh, it's located west of Lynn Road and Wildwood Park uh, is accessed from this point. And here's an aerial photograph uh, zooming in at the intersection. And uh, as you recall, last year we had three incidents where a driver on westbound Arbalus failed to make a right turn onto Big Sky Drive, subsequently striking that uh, wall there at 940 Bright Star Circle. And each of the three incidents, uh, the driver was found to be DUI, and each incident occurred uh, at night. So at the last uh, March Traffic Commission meeting, we uh, came up with a number of uh, option concepts. and. Option number four, which is shown here in this graphic, is the one that the Traffic Commission recommended that be developed further. Uh, it features a new guard rail or a new median on Big Sky Drive all the way up to Bright Star Circle. Inside that um, median would have guardrail. Uh, no parking zones on both sides of Bright Star Circle. Uh, at the Wildwood Park driveway, we would continue to have the existing left turns into the park and U-turns. And uh, there was also a uh, request to not have this location have stop sign control from Arbalus into Big Sky Drive. So um, over the last couple months, we've developed that option further. And here's a uh, graphic that shows uh, what we've come up with. Uh, we've uh, taken a number of field surveys for drainage reasons and research underground utility conflicts. And the proposed design is uh, shown here. Uh, let me just zoom in a little bit more on that uh, median design that's uh, all the way up to Bright Star Circle. As you notice, uh, there is a guardrail placed at the front of the median. And um, the idea here is that if an errant vehicle were to strike the curb, uh, it would uh, immediately hit the guardrail. Uh, the guardrail would absorb that vehicle's energy and the vehicle would um, deflect back into the street. And the distance of this guardrail would span a distance of about 70 feet. I think in your staff report, uh, we did uh, show a design of 60 feet. So what we've done is modified that design and added 10 additional feet um, as you go up towards the left turn pocket. Um, the um, uh, Chevron signs will be placed behind the guardrail to help direct traffic as you come off Arbalest, uh, guiding them into uh, uh, Big Sky Drive. Uh, and then as you enter 
um, the Wildwood Park driveway will post a yield sign to uh, make sure or remind drivers that they need to yield to drivers coming out of Big Sky Drive. And no parking signs will be posted on both sides of the street. Um, here's a graphic that shows the uh, general region shown in that yellow circle where the uh, errant vehicles in the past have traveled through the intersection. And with this uh, design where we place the guardrail, it's going to be in the area and beyond the uh, areas where the previous errant vehicles have traveled through the intersection. So we expect this design that we've developed to provide the desired protection that we're looking for at the intersection. Um, in addition to um, the uh, concerns over safety at the intersection, we heard that there's uh, concerns, of, concerns of speeding on Arbalus. So we developed um, striping plans to show we're going to add a buffer zone between the travel lane and the bike lane. And um, it's on both sides of the street. And let me just show you a, a, a photograph taken on Pedersen Road where we've actually implemented this type of design. Uh, the travel lane um, would be narrowed. <coughs> the buffer zone would be, be about five feet wide. And then you have your bike lane next to the, the curb on the right side. Uh, three months after we implement uh, this type of striping on Arbalus, we'll measure uh, the s s uh, speeds out there and we'll see whether or not we can reduce uh, the speed limit. So tonight we'll receive the um, uh, input from the uh, uh, public and as well as the traffic commission on the design that's been developed to the 90% level. We mailed out about 100 meeting notices last week inviting residents to come down to the meeting tonight to provide any input. And um, uh, we'll make any adjustments as needed to the design so that the council can consider the final design at their September 12th meeting. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mishiko. Uh, Commissioner Lemo. Just, just one question. In your design and in what you gave us in our notes, mm -hmm. I saw where it shows out of the park. But does, is, that, is that a cutout then in the buffer zone as well? Or does, do you just roll over that when you're coming out? You, just have, you know how, where you showed the outbound from Wildwood? Was it on this graph? It was on our draft. It was. N I did not see the outbound yeah. view from Wildwood tonight. I saw where you can turn into Wildwood there, and I saw that on our draft. But I also see that on our draft, it 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 cuts through the buffer zone. It's just is that something you just drive through? You don't need to have it marked in any way. Actually, that will be an opening. That that will. The the buffer zone will start we'll and stop, and you will have a path to travel between. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Mr. Lemo. That's a good point. That's important. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Ms. Angler. I have a question about the existing uh, area in front of 940 uh, where the cars, the vehicles have traveled through. Is that city land along, um, uh, along Bright Star? Is that something that we have to replace since we're, are we removing the guardrails that are there and the, you know, are we, how are we treating that with the reconfiguration? Okay, uh, the, uh, there's that area that's immediately in front of that wall that's been damaged. Uh, I believe behind the sidewalk, the first uh, five feet or so is city right away, and then once you get past that, where the bushes are, or the vegetation is, then that's all private property. But we plan to remove what's, what's currently out there now to be replaced by this design that's being proposed. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Good. Um, we'll move on to public comments. There are two speakers tonight. We'll start with David Dumay. Please state your name and city of residence. Yes. Hi. David Dumay, 940 Bright Star Circle. Good evening, commissioners. Happy summer. Um, I, too, I'm in summer retire, so that's a good thing. Um, thank you, staff, for working on this. I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to some folks in the field and, and both in the office, um, uh, and, I, and I like the plan. Uh, the section that I'm not really um, sold on yet is, I just talked to Mr. Mashiko was the flaring rate. The flaring rate as it comes off of that 27 inches Right, it comes down to grade, basically. Um, so part of my concern, obviously, is an errant vehicle that says, 
you know, oh my gosh, I got to make that right turn. And they centrifugal force forces them out that way and, and heads out there. So um, I understand that there's an issue with existing um, water mains. Um, I just have to ask the question. And, and Mr. Finley, you're looking at me kind of sideways. So if I'm not explaining it well, um, is that vehicle that, that goes and starts heading out toward that flare rate, if that's going to catch somebody? That would be my concern for that particular design because that's a little bit different than what we looked at before. Um, so, so that's one. Uh, it looks like it's designed to keep the vehicles in the street, which I've talked about from the beginning, and that's, that's good. And I would have to ask, is this going to replicate, uh, Mr. Reader, your, your 4,000 pounds dropping from five stories or whatever scenario, is this going to stop that? And I'd have to ask those folks. Um, Eventually, I think, we're going to have to end up with a stop sign turning into a park. Um, the yield sign is a good start, uh, but I'll tell you, when you go around that corner from the house, people are not looking to the right. Mm -hmm. So whether there's striping or signage in the street, you know, just like a stop sign says yield with a limit line or something, maybe that'll help folks get the idea because they're looking for the park. They're not looking for anybody else coming through. So... Those are the comments I have. The flare pattern is uh, the flare rate. Is that going to stop somebody from from hitting the uh, north end of the house if they go errant? Um, is it going to stop Mr. Reader's example of the four thousand pound vehicle? Is that going to happen? And I think eventually we're going to need a stop sign. That's all my comments. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank Things you. Things are all. looking up, aren't they? Yes, sir. Yes. We, and when we have construction in our backyard, that's yeah. even a Good. even a better thing. Nine thing, <laughs> nine months down the road. Does staff have any comments uh, regarding the speaker's points of view? Um, yes. Um, let's see. We we believe um, that the, uh, the 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 length of the wall. We we actually made it an additional ten feet. If you look at the graphic up there, we we've actually designed the length of that so that um, an errant vehicle would if if they got. If somehow they were able to get around that corner and not hit the guardrail um, or hit the end of the guardrail, they would, as you can see from that, if they were on that tangent, would go would would miss the house by significant uh, amount. So we believe at this point that that is sufficient and and works. Um, again, we're, we'll look again, and um, there is a there is a water line directly beneath that portion of the guardrail um and and as it, as that meeting gets narrower and narrower um we we don't want to just continue to extend the guardrail down that very narrow median because you won't be able to landscape around it and it'll, it'll really look awful so we really don't want it any longer than it needs to be we think we're there but we'll we'll look again correct yeah so what so what we did is actually this this graphic as you could see, uh, misses the house by uh, a significant amount. And, and that's why we added that additional 10 feet was because of the flare. Um, we actually extended the full height guardrail another 10 feet before we started to, uh, to reduce that to grade. So we think we're in good shape. We'll, we'll look again and then look one more time. Um, distance between the the terminus of the median and that next post what that height gets in other words I'll just run around real quick do we need a microphone yeah. so so the height will be the same all the way up until the last post second to the last post and then it will go from on that last post it'll be at 27 inches, I believe, is the elevation, and it will drop down to zero at the last post. Right, so second to last post, where it's still at 27 inches, full height. Okay. It that's standard height. Okay, and I guess I'm, maybe we can talk afterwards, and because to me it, it goes down from 27 to zero, so there's some loss of height, correct? Yes, and that loss of height is in a zone beyond where we're counting on any effectiveness of that barrier. So as soon as we as soon as we drop below 27 inches, we're, we're, we're pretending that that no longer exists. Right, and if you go back to the graphic of where... She, Mr. Mr. DeMai, <coughs> uh, we have to 
stop at this point. Your time is is up. Yeah. So thank you for coming. And I think we can all agree that uh, no one tries to test the efficiency of this design. Oh, no. That's, that's, it's a different design than what was before. And this is well, I mean a driver. Yes. I mean a driver tests it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. No. Appreciate it. Thank Our you. next speaker will be Mark, is it Lichuk? I should know that because you were here before. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, you. Please state your name and city of residence. My name is Mark Lichok. I live in Thousand Oaks in the Wildwood section. I'm a neighbor of Dave's, and I fully support uh, what Dave is asking for. You know, we just want to make sure too that the if a car does come slamming into that air, that barrier, that as it continues on, it doesn't go to the end and then then goes into the house. So we just want to make sure of that. Uh, wanted to say that the we are making progress. This is good. Um, uh, the detailed information on the designs, very good. Uh, good quality and everything. Um, you have taken into account pretty much all of the ideas and concerns that the neighborhood has had. So we thank you for that. Um, one concern that I do have, and a couple questions, uh, is the sense of urgency. Uh, the whole idea of this was to keep the design simple, keep it small, uh, so that it would be done within three to six months which kind of puts it into a September time frame. Now we're talking about a winter time frame, which is December, January. Um, I'm new to this process and it's, you know, the various stages of reviews, the 90% one, the 9,500 city council. It would be nice if there was almost like a checklist or a, uh, a list of what are the steps and approximate estimated dates as to when these would be done so that we as the public the neighborhood would know when it's going to go in, uh, when the board would know so that you could follow up on it and make sure it does get done. Um, it's not written in stone, but at least would give everyone a guideline as well as set expectations. Because one thing that I did hear about from the neighbors that did read the letter was the first thing that came across their mind was, we thought we already talked about the design, uh, followed by we thought it was going to be done toward the end of summer, beginning of fall. Now it's talking about winter 2018. And as soon as people saw 2018, that really scared people. So I'd recommend to the board if you could ask for uh, sort of a project plan, uh, just a listing of the various steps that are still to go in estimated times, uh, especially considering that we have summer where the meetings are intermittent. Uh, the timeline is definitely getting stretched out and we definitely wanna get this rectified as soon as possible. A uh, Couple questions on the design. Uh, in the buffer zone, uh, you mentioned that it's gonna be similar to uh, the Velarde crossing across from Wildwood Elementary. Are there going to be any of the, what is it, quieter posts, uh, like they're two feet high uh, along that stretch, or any rumble bumps or anything, or is it just uh, a painted buffer zone? Okay. Yes. And then question, um, the uh, second question is, uh, what would be good? Uh, one of the problems that we currently have now with the intersection is that the GPS does not register the turning into Wildwood as legitimate, so therefore it's directing traffic down uh, Frontier onto Bright Star, back onto Big Sky, into the park. Uh, hopefully this design will take care of it, but one thing that might also take care of it, because we're not guaranteed of this, um, to put a sign at the beginning, right at like around Frontier on the median, that says Wildwood Park with an arrow that lists straight ahead so people will stop maybe paying attention to the GPS at that point and just continue on straight to this intersection. Um, I don't know which department to go to for that. Uh, it's a Wildwood request thing, so CRPD, Costco. It's a traffic thing because it's a street sign. It's public works because it's got to be put in. Wherever you could help me out with that, I think that would be a good idea. And along with the yield sign uh, right there at the parking lot, um, maybe another smaller sign that says Wildwood to the left so that to differentiate from all the yield signs pointing to the right, um, as well as maybe to slow them down or to wake them up. Uh, I don't know if this is an idea or not, uh, to kind of rough up the street or put um, lines in the street so that you hear a little bit of a rumble, but that might be a disturbing to the neighbor, so I'm not sure about that. So minute, I, I'm learning. All right, thank you. Okie doke. Appreciate thank you very you much. coming for expressing your opinions. Um, Mr. Finley, did you want to comment on those points? 
Yes, I'll take a couple of these, and I'll let Jim take one as well. Um, first of all, we will uh, uh, continue to uh, work with Mr. Dumay and uh, make sure that his concerns are, are satisfied um, as we finalize this design over the, the coming weeks. Um, as far as the project schedule, we will go to council in September, and uh, at that point we will be ready to go out to bid. Um, we will expect uh, that contract to be awarded in uh, probably late October, and uh, the construction period probably will not be significant. So I would actually hope that it's done before, by the end of 2017, before winter. Uh, I say that, but unless we get some significant rain, but even even out there, it's 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 on pavement. It's really not not going to be an issue. Um, and and the process does take a while when you when you're working through council. Um, directional signs in the median, absolutely. We will uh, work with CRPD to do that. That was one of the things that's actually included, will be included in our final plans. So, and I think there was a question about the buffer zone, which Mr. Mashiko will answer. Okay, yeah, in terms of the buffer zone, uh, basically all that will be paint. Uh, we don't plan to add any rumble strips or anything that might cause uh, noise uh, because I, in, in the past, I think we may have tried that years and years ago, but uh, uh, the issue with that is, yeah, it just it just creates more of a disturbance than anything. Uh, there are some posts that I think um, are near Velarde, near the school, and the reason why that those were put in was uh, during the school hours when the traffic is uh, stopped, uh, there's cars that would try to move to the right when the crossing guard is stopping the kids, and then they would travel through that bike lane. That's the reason why those posts are just at that specific location. So we don't plan to use those posts anywhere else. Thank you, Mr. Mashiko. Um, Ms. Zambarna, I should ask if there's any written statements regarding this matter. We did not receive any written statement cards for this item. Duly noted. Thank you. Now we can get on to item 6C. Thousand Oaks Boulevard parking space markings, Moor Park Road to Hoden Camp. Uh, Mr. Mashiko uh, has an informational uh, item for us. Mr. Mashiko. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ch uh, Chair Reader. Uh, basically, there's um, uh, just a summary or a, a copy of the staff report that went to City Council uh, last week that was approved to install uh, marked parking spaces on TOB uh, from Moore Park up to Houghton Camp. And uh, we're going to be putting in about 63 marked parking spaces. And it's something that uh, the business owners, um, Toba, had asked uh, that we consider. And we're going to move forward with that. Uh, hopefully we can uh, get that in, in over the next month. And um, if it's if it's successful, uh, we'll see um, if you know we can expand that down further down the boulevard. Thank you, Mr. Mashiko. Um, are there any comments from commissioners? No. Um, Ms. I understand there's no public speakers or on this matter. Very good. And uh, personally, I think it's a great idea because uh, to designate where you can park without having to look at curb colors or a sign on the sidewalk. <laughs> It's it's a, a wonderful improvement to our city, I think. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, did we receive any uh, written statements regarding that? No, there are no written statement cards for that item. All right. That brings us then to item seven, uh, status report of prior traffic commission recommendations. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, we have 6D. First, oh, which is another information item. I got to figure out how to do this better. I'm still missing 60. See? There it is. Westlake Boulevard medium modifications update. Again, Engineer Mashiko. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> this one's real brief. Uh, basically, the story, um, as far as the, the uh, safety uh, at that intersection of Arbalest and Westlake has increased. Uh, there's a graphic, uh, a bar chart shown as attachment three in the staff report that shows over time uh, what we had there when uh, we had our previous uh, striping were uh, for the northbound um, left turn movement. We had two lefts and then a shared uh, movement from that 
uh, rightmost lane, and that was modified uh, in 2015. Um, that location was one of our higher collision rate locations, and as you can see on the bar chart, we had as, as much as uh, 11 inter, uh, collisions in, in one year. Uh, the c project was completed um, in 2015, and then during the 2016 calendar year, we only had one collision there, so it, it seems to have been very effective, the, uh, the modifications that were made. Thank you. Any questions? Um, oh, yes, uh, Ms. Engler. Yeah. I was wondering um, what queuing might be happening uh, for traffic that's coming down to that um, intersection, if there's any backup that we were worried about. Yeah, we've been monitoring to that uh, location um, off and on. We do know that during the PM peak hour, that's the time at which there's that queuing issue. Um, sometimes it'll extend past Lang Ranch Parkway. Um, and it's, it's basically, we're looking at a maybe a 15, 20 minute window during the, the evening commute time at which it backs up and then after that it starts to ease up again. So you'll see during the, uh, anytime after four it starts to build up, it hits its peak for about 15, 20 minutes and then starts to d dissipate again. Um, but that's just something that it, it's, it's a very challenging um, uh, location to try to get rid of that backups due to the uh, level of volume that's flowing through that intersection. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I assume there's no uh, speakers and no written comments. Thank you. Item 7, status report of prior traffic commission recommendations. Okay, this one um, was to let you know that uh, on June 13th, uh, we heard that, or the city council approved moving forward with putting in more flashing yellow in, um, uh, arrows at our intersections. I believe there's eight, and um, we're moving ahead with that, and, and I believe we'll start getting some of those installed later this year. Good news. Thank you. Item 8, Commission Referrals from May 15th. I don't believe there are any. Any comments? None. Um, item 9, Work Program and Commission Schedule. Any comments, Commissioners? And Item 10, Traffic Commission Comments and Discussion. Anything to... Yes, Mr. Lemel. I do. I don't want to lengthen our meeting any more than necessary, but I do have some comments. Um, particularly after our most recent Wildwood discussion, but I think it's important for us to remember this in regards to so many things, and I really want the public to be able to hear it. And I'm sorry that our guests left. Um, first of all, in regards to timing and why it takes so long, I, will, I want to tell staff, as somebody who's in the business that has to deal with the community, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, much like you do, but not quite as intense as you do. There is nothing ever better than taking enough time to hear the community's opinion. Doesn't mean you have to follow it, but the single thing that would have had the most delay here were two clear actions, community outreach by staff and reconsideration by the commission. This decision was made, and because of community output, we uh, input, we reconsider the condition. So I think it's important for the public to know that there was absolutely, positively no delay here that wouldn't fall under the definition of either gathering more info from the community, listening to the info and trying to incorporate it into a plan, or statutory timelines that we had to follow. Secondly, I think it's it's really important for the public to learn what we've had to learn, and I'm the longest serving commissioner tonight, and that's just a year less than, um, than Mr. Gregory. Mm -hmm. And that is that the perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. I would hope that staff is not trying to make everything perfect. It's an impossibility. The intersection they designed there is unbelievably close to that perfect. If and, and remember, okay, this is something, I mean, if, if you go back as to why we're studying this, I don't recall one sober, regular driver 
making any mistake with the old way that the intersection was. It has been three drunk drivers that did damage to someone's property, and the city is stepping forward to help that situation. I remember in our first meeting, there was nobody that wanted to protect the drunk drivers. Okay, It was like, put up a steel wall, wish them good luck. Okay, That's not what we ended up doing, thankfully. But to be able to anticipate that even if there were three more, that first of all, they're not going to end. It's a physical impossibility to come to the end of that guardrail with the same speed that you had your initial impact. So there's no way you're launching into anything other than maybe if you're really going fast. Maybe you're launching yourself into trees, but I find that hard to believe. And so I think it's important for the public to know that our staff was able to gather everybody's opinion, very minimally increase the timeline, provide counsel with the right input that they need after we were done, and and all through all this, making sure it was safe and it just didn't, you know, I, I felt bad for the gentleman that said, well, you know, this is my house. Yes. The only ones really protecting his house is the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, and I'm not going to go get into what I would do if it was my house. But um, I don't want us to be too serious about the suggestion of a checklist. I think our staff has a very good checklist, but they also have a very interesting way of being able to amend their chest checklist to get more community input. And so I just wanted to be on the record tonight, and I'm sure this will replay at least once or twice in the summer reruns or something. Um, and uh, so if people are sick of watching Game of Thrones, they can watch this ah. instead. But I, I just think it's important that, that our staff hears that and that we have policies that support doing it right as opposed to doing it fast. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lemo. I just have one comment, and then I'll recognize you. Um, I, I sure appreciate your wisdom and, and longevity uh, to bring these thoughts to our commission because I uh, I listen with uh, things I'd never really thought about before, and I'm so glad that uh, you bring those up, Mr. Lemo. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I wanted to build off of um, Commissioner Lemo's points about uh, you know, how do we educate the public? Because we know that nothing, no, no one pays attention until it is your house. And so maybe we can use this specific case as a little bit of a case study about that process of the city and, and what it's like when you have an issue to come forward and, and how it works um, so that people aren't caught off guard with the timelines and things, but just something really easy uh, and digestible in a case study kind of format, a success story I'm visualizing after the completion of the construction, a real a real win for everybody because like Commissioner Limo said, you know, the city's really stepping up to protect that homeowner, which is really, you know, very impressive. Thank you. I just have one comment. And that is, um, being summertime, I'm traveling around visiting different cities, and um, one city in particular uh, was so frustrating to drive in because lights would turn red for no reason, no one's there, you couldn't turn left, and you, you, we all know the, the drill. But in this city, there's a Mr. Uh, Robert Sweeting that is in charge of all our signals, and he does a fantastic job. I, I I didn't realize it until I saw a city that wasn't doing a good job. So I want to uh, give him some kudos. Uh, I know he sits down and monitors the the uh, cameras and things, and uh, when th things start to get backed up, he lets the lights run a little bit longer, or if there's no one there, they run a little shorter. So he does such a great job to make our city great like it is. So thank you, Mr. Sweeting. Appreciate it. Any other comments? Uh-oh, what did I do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I wanted to um, acknowledge the city for all of the people who have been part of this process. I, I was not here for January's uh, hearing on um, this gentleman's problems. And I know that the, the, the collisions that were occurring, a lot of cases were, they were there were more, there was more than four, but there were th more than three. There were three that went into his backyard that were directly related to alcohol abuse. And I just want to share that while the uh, city has worked very hard to achieve a, 
a design that I, in my hope of hopes is going to work. Um, I also recognize that there's nothing we can actually design that will prevent uh, someone from driving under the influence. So I recognize our challenges and I, I am very proud of where this commission and where this um, uh, city has gotten to at this point. I think it's the best choice that it, there is in front of us, uh, and I'm hopeful that it's very, uh, very suc wildly successful in preventing any additional collisions. But thank you to the staff for all that you've done to help the citizens get to us to communicate their concerns and learn the uh, process that we have to go through to really design the best thing that we can accomplish. And on a completely separate note, since we don't have the August meeting, um, school is back August 23rd for the Caneo Valley. And I know that usually we have people coming forward after the start of school complaining of drivers and, and parents on their cell phones and on conference calls and blazing down Lynn Road. And, and um, hearing from Karen Martin earlier in the meeting reminded me about the Make Lynn Road Safety Initiative that happened I think it was last fall or you know in 2016 at some point so to head off some of those issues is there a possibility that we could get a nice friendly letter a reminder for parents from the traffic and transportation committee or the city of Thousand Oaks about back to school and just head this off so that the schools would have something that they could potentially give to the parents um, on their websites or on our behalf and that could be posted potentially on some of these um, parent Facebook pages that are so popular so that we could get ahead and anticipate these issues for the fall. Or some of the per things that we'll be doing and seeing from um, our local Thousand Oaks Police Department to remind parents and drivers of back to school zones and things like that. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lemo? Just one last thing. Um, I'm pretty sure that July 25th is the day that the state of California has a new set of distracted driving laws. And a lot of times um, when you're out, I drive a lot, you see these signs above the freeways and sometimes our own electric signs that remind people that we're in the process of a crackdown. Um, and if there's a way that we can, you know, begin to send that message for maybe 30 days, that takes you two weeks into the start of the school year. Um, I will tell you that the majority of people that speed in my neighborhood not only are from my neighborhood, but they're on a cell phone at the same time. So this maybe this will make a positive impact. Thank you, Mr. Lemo. Does that conclude everything? Good. All right, the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission is now adjourned until 6 p.m. on September 20th, 2017 in the boardroom of the Civic Arts Plaza, the third floor. Thanks for joining us. Good night.